Welcome to the West Hearts College podcast series, The Industry in Isolation. Each week we'll be speaking to various professionals across the creative industries to answer student questions and to find out what the secret is to their success. Dan, could you sum up for us in in one sentence what it is that you actually do for a living? Uh, currently, I run a band called the Blue Jays, who are a 1950s rock and roll band, and I currently produce the theatre show that we take around the country. Cool. Thanks very much. OK, so how did you become interested in theatre? Uh, both my parents worked in theatre and have done for a while well, since I was born and before then. Uh, and so I used to go and watch things that either my mum was in or that my dad was producing, and it sort of went from there, really. Uh, I was just sort of involved in it from quite an early age. So your dad was a producer as well? Yeah, so he started off as an agent, and then he got into producing, uh, and he'd also worked as a stage manager as well, so he's sort of done a lot of different jobs apart from performing. He's dabbled in it a bit, but he was more in the sort of the other side of it, whereas my mum was an actor and a singer and a dancer. Ah, oh, very nice, a triple threat. So <laughs> quite quite a theatrical background you've got going on there. So then where did your training kind of begin for, for this? Um, any sort of acting stuff I did, it sort of, I, I did, I, I didn't really have training in acting really. I sort of did it as I went along and I went to a few courses that were nearby to me uh, in Southwest London, which was sort of after school classes. Uh, musically, I went to Berklee College of Music, which is in the US and did a three year degree course uh, over there. Uh, when I was about 21 till I was about 24. Wow, that's quite a long way away. It was worth it, though. It was worth it. <laughs> that's really cool. So how did you end up back in the UK and doing theatre then? Uh, I ended up back in the UK because it's just very, very difficult to stay over there as an artist. Well, it was, I mean, this is like, you know, 15 years ago. Um, so I came back and it was sort of by luck, really. I did a few gigs over here, which were just sort of one night of shows through people that I knew and then someone else who I knew was in Buddy Holly the Buddy Holly story in the West End and they said they were auditioning for the tour uh, and I just went up for that and luckily got the job and it sort of started from there. Amazing okay well in that case can you talk us through that first audition what was that like? Uh, terrifying because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a musician and I can play I play drums foremost I can play keyboards a little bit and I can sing a little bit but at the audition you had to uh play drums for a little bit do a bit of acting and then sing two songs and it was at the duchess theater and my first ever audition was having to play drums and then t sing and you know perform essentially two wow. songs on your own on stage which for most actors is probably quite normal but when it's your first ever audition and you've not done that much of that before it's quite daunting okay so what would be the best piece of advice you'd give to someone in that situation and going into their first proper theater audition it's the hardest thing to say about anything and it's, it seems like a, a easier said than done, but just to try and be as calm as possible and, and just realise that um, it, one, in some cases, the people watching you can be as nervous as you are, which just sounds weird because they are wanting you to be good when they come in. They don't want to see people fail. They want you to be good. So they're with you from minute one. Uh, and the second thing is that if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out and just know that you've gone in there and gone, well, that's the best I could have done. I couldn't have done any better if they've gone a different way, then there's maybe multiple reasons for that. But you just sort of have to try and be calm. Also, because for me personally, nerves can start dictating what you do performance wise. Mm -hmm. So I think you always have to try and stay calm is my main bit of advice. No, I think that's a really good bit of advice. I think everyone can definitely relate to that. Um, so you mentioned that Buddy Holly was your first theatre job. So what what did you learn by actually being on the job? I think because I didn't have that much acting training, there was a lot of sort of some technical stuff that I guess I would learn on there. And, uh, you know, the first job I ever did, I had to be from Texas because I was portraying Jerry Allison, who was a real person, who was uh, the cricket's drummer. Uh, so there was a lot of that. And, um, yeah, I couldn't really put my finger on only one thing. You just, I think as I did lots of jobs after that, there were acting jobs. You just sort of learn from watching other people, how they performed, mm. how they projected, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, just learning as I went along, really. Did you feel that maybe coming from a musical background rather than coming from a, a you know, proper acting training, if you like, um, set you at a disadvantage? Or did you find that you brought other things to the table that other people couldn't? Or I think because... It's an acting musician show, so everyone does both. And so therefore, I think 
I wasn't in that much of a different boat in that a lot of people have sort of had split training in two different things. So they weren't just actors and they weren't just musicians. Uh, and because I had a bit of experience through working with my parents and watching what they did, I sort of felt comfortable. But I was very nervous going into it because I didn't know what to expect. Um, but you sort of I was I felt quite at home there. It's a weird thing to say, but I felt quite at home in that everyone felt like, you know, similar to me, that they were all sort of a bit nervous about having to play 12 different instruments and also act. Yeah, I can imagine it could be quite tricky to get your head around. Yeah, a little um, bit. OK, so then what do you think are the benefits of being an active musician in this industry? Uh, it obviously just opens you up to more work. There's a lot more like certain theatres like the Watermill uh, and a lot of the rep theatres up north do stuff that are specifically active musician productions where they'll be wanting you to play and sing and in some cases wanting you to play six different instruments mm. so it doesn't hurt i've known some people that are in the active musician industry and they will just go and take jobs as musicians if there's nothing else going on that's quite handy you can either go and just play in the pit or you could do some rsc stuff where they just want musicians to just play above them uh above the cast and uh things like that so i think it's just it's just another string to your bow in the same way of sort of being triple threat will hopefully get you more work it's the same mm. with being active musician yeah so you're not really limiting yourself to one particular strand of work i guess no, exactly. And you can obviously still go up for straight plays if you're if you're good enough and you can go up for musicals as well. But obviously you you can also do the active musician stuff, too. OK, well, then um, tell us a little bit more then. What's been your best theatre experience as an actor musician? Uh, I, was, I was never really sort of a set plan to go on the whole theatre route, but I was doing uh, Dreamboats and Petticoats for Bill Kemwright for about a year on tour. And it's, you know, it was quite monotonous, but it was a fun job. And I was going to leave just because I'd sort of, you know, had enough of doing that. And they said, if you, you, if we put you in the West End version, would it make you stay? And I said, yes. Um, and obviously <laughs> that was lovely to actually have been in the West End. Doing a show in the West End was amazing. And it made for a very easy life at the time because I was living in Wimbledon. So that journey was about half an hour every day. <laughs> into work and it was it was a big like that it was always sold out of that theater and got to work with quite a few they'd they'd bring like celebrities i say celebrities come in to play one of the roles so i got to work with like tony christie and people like that from you know wow. the olden days but um yes yeah, so i would say <laughs> i would say probably that it was quite it was only a few months i did it but yeah it was, it was good fun and what do you think um having done both would would you say the differences are between say regional theater and the west end I just guess reputation. I mean, a lot of the regional theatres are amazing. And if you're on tour with like a buddy or a dream about some petticoats, they still go to very big venues, which are like between 1,000 and 3,000. If you go to somewhere like Edinburgh, that's massive. But I think it's just there's a bit of a buzz of being in the West End. And obviously that's where if you're in theatre, a lot of people want to end up. Mm. So to sort of end up by accident, I know I was very lucky to do that. And it just felt like a bit of a privilege going to do that every night. Amazing. Tell us a little bit about um, the theatre show that you produce and how you guys came up with the idea. So I did. I set the Blue Jays up about seven years ago, and the Blue Jays are, as I say, they're a 1950s rock and roll band, and we play all the classics of, you know, Elvis, Eddie Cochran, all those sort of people. And it's just grown really. It used to be just weddings and functions, and then we started doing more big private work, and we've done a lot of cruises and and big events all over the world. And we thought, well, the only real if you're a covers band as it were the only sort of thing you can do to reach the big heights are to do a theatre tour um and so for the last three years I'd say we'd sort of always talked about taking it around the country to different theatres um and I'd say two and a half years ago we just ended up doing it and uh and that's what we're currently in the middle of now or we were before the whole isolation thing happened <laughs> yeah absolutely do you prefer the producing style? Is it different to, to being an actor musician in many ways or is it quite similar? It's very different, I would say. Just there's so much admin stuff to do. It's a lot more office based. But I've, when it comes to the Blue Jays, I've enjoyed that because I've been doing that. I've been playing the Blue Jays for seven years. And before that, I was in Buddy and Dreamboats and those sort of shows for three years. So it's like over 10 years of playing mostly 50s music. So to have a break from that has been quite nice. And it's also been just another thing to be able to learn. It's like, you know, uh, learning about production, even though my dad did it, I've sort of tried to do it all myself. And with the two other guys I run the business with, we've tried to learn everything as we go. So that's been a very good experience. So personally, I do quite enjoy it. And as you say, you work in partnership with two other producers yep. um, who are also in the show with you. So what are the dynamics like of the working relationship that you guys have and how do you thrive within that? So we've been, yeah, we've been, myself and Chris, who's the bass player, have been there since the beginning. And then Ollie, who's the lead singer and the other producer, came in about three years ago. Uh, 
and you sort of just adapt to what your skill set are. So Chris has been, become very good at design. He's been very good at Photoshop and video editing, which has helped massively for like online presence and when we churn out videos and marketing, um, which is another theme to go down. But um, and then Ollie uh, is very business headed. He's very financial headed. So he's been, you know, he's always doing the accounts. Uh, and between him and me, we book all the theatres. Um, and we just do it all mostly on good old group chat because we're dotted around the country. Um, so a lot of messages go through the day on WhatsApp just about, you know, it, I, you know, we share an email. So if the messages come into the email, we'll say, right, I'm going to grab that. Can you do this? Can you do that? So it seems to work pretty well. Um, the only thing with WhatsApp is that sometimes you can get into spats. But other than that, it's fine. <laughs> well, we all enjoy a good old spat. So what exactly. do you think of the pitfalls that you need to avoid then when you're working with other people in, in such close quarters like that? Well, we were, we were friends. Um, well, we were, we were workmates first, I guess, but then we were friends through doing the. We all met in the Buddy Holly story show, so we were friends that way. And obviously, they say uh, friends, business, and pleasure sometimes difficult. So that's sometimes uh, difficult. You just have to be honest and communicate very well. It's the same, you know, in any walk of life, but especially when you're working together, you have to be open. Um, and we 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 will also try and meet in person once a week. Mm -hmm. um it's just so much easier talking face to face even on the phone is easier than than the whatsapp thing we just do the whatsapp thing because it's the easiest way to communicate sometimes but you know if you can read a text message and you can sort of read it the wrong way uh, or not really get someone's tone so i think as long as you still meet in person or meet face to face or just on the phone it's just a lot easier to communicate and be sort of more on the same same wavelength and do you often find that you have to compromise on your ideas i mean i think a lot of us kind of start out with an idea and, and put that forward and say oh yeah this would be really really good and then other people don't quite always latch on to it um you know what do you do when you kind of come up against it with you know with three of you i imagine that can be quite tricky or is it easier i don't know yeah it can be you have to sort of swallow your pride a little bit and it, the good thing is is that we used to do this a while ago when there was four, four of us running the business and therefore if you have two people disagreeing with two people you're sort of in this stalemate for a long time mm. which is very very difficult to sort out now there's three of us it means there'll always be a vote there'll always be a you know two against one thing um and I think you just have to, yeah, you don't have to see it as a battle. Like if your idea doesn't get pushed through, you go, OK, well, that's not worked in this. If it, you know, if it's worth pursuing, you can keep on at it and then maybe they'll see, you know, your your way. But I think most of the time you just have to go with the flow. And as I say, not not be too uh, proud and just sort of <laughs> and, and get on with it. No, absolutely. Um, so one of the questions that a lot of our students are having to do some work on at the moment, actually, is around um, actually funding and financing a project. So um, obviously it's quite difficult to finance theatre. Um, so I guess my question is, how did you guys manage it? Did you use public funding from a government body or was it you know, privately funded or um, you know, what were your experiences of doing that? So before the theatre show was set up, the Blue Jays was a business and we were sort of obviously making money from doing gigs and private events. And when we knew the theatre show was sort of in the, in the near distance and we were going to start um, doing it, we started holding some of that money back um, we had no idea what it was going to cost to begin with. We also didn't know how much we were going to have to spend on stuff like there's not much of a set in the show, which I'll go into in a minute. But um, we didn't really know how much. So we just kept sort of saving a little uh, each time. We also tried to do Arts Council funding, which is quite a good thing that you can do through the government. But mm. we didn't get it. And I sort of understand why we didn't get it, because we are essentially a band who are playing covers of uh, of artists. So as much as we try to keep the show fresh and new and different to other than different to those other sorts of shows um it's not into it's not new writing exactly which is what the arts council i think are more looking out for so it was mostly through our own money to answer your question okay interesting what kind of theaters does the show play then um when we started we were i mean through my knowledge and through working you know for what my dad used to do he used to do a lot of touring theaters to sort of different scales from 300 to about 3000 we sort of were trying to be careful. And in the first year, we were just going to theatres of a capacity of, of 300 to 500. 500 was the absolute maximum because we thought, you know, if we go to a venue in Leeds or somewhere and we can't get more than 50, it would be embarrassing in a big old theatre to have uh, empty seats. So we started at very small regional theatres. You can sort of divide them into A, B and C theatres in terms of size and, and what sort of shows go there. And obviously we need to, we, we only do one night performances. So we'll do one night somewhere, then have a break maybe, then go one night somewhere else. So you can't go to like the big theatres that will only take weekly shows like Wicked or Beautiful or something like that. Mm. So you have to be quite selective. But since the first year, we've grown a little bit. Um, 
this year we did Chichester for the first time, which is 1,300 seats, and it was sold out, which is bonkers. But wow. um, so it's it's a very very slow process. But um, we, yeah, I would say now it's about 500 upwards that we go to seating wise. Okay, so talk me through the the process of creating the theatre show. How did you guys you know what was the starting point, if you like, and how did it grow into the show that you have now? I think it was just how we were going to present it. There are a lot of regional theatre shows out there that do 50s music where they literally just come out and play the songs. There's not much chat or or they do it to where they'll come out and they'll be like, oh, OK, now I'm pretending to be Elvis. Now I'm pretending to be Chuck Berry. And we sort of see that. Uh, we sort of saw that as being a bit cheesy and we wanted to try and not in a boring way, but try and tell a story of, of the era and where the songs came from. So we sort of progressed from right at the beginning of the 50s till late 60s and sort of try and tell a story throughout that era um, in terms of how the songs, where the songs came from and what genres inspired other genres. We've got a screen behind us, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got a screen behind us which um, shows video and shows pictures of the artists and shows a little bit of information. Um, and then we and then we play the song. So uh, it's we spent about four to five months researching all of that and then trying to make it fun as well as not being boring for two hours. So what's the long term goal for the show? Just to keep growing it, it really is a long term plan. If, if we look at where we have been from this is the year three we're in now and up to when uh, coronavirus happened, it was starting to, to grow in terms of if we were getting bigger numbers into theatres. We were going to the theatres that we'd been to before and seeing much uh, bigger growth in the audience and selling out more, which is good. And I think post uh, after that, it is to get to bigger theatres. So we're looking next year for theatres that are about a thousand seats upwards. Um, but again, it depends on what everything, how everything pans out. And then the idea is to get it into Europe uh, and then maybe other countries. We've had chats with people in Holland who are quite interested in it and we might go further afield. But obviously it's a slow it's a bit of a slow burner, but that, that's the, for me, that's the aim is to sort of get this almost worldwide. So when you're um, looking at places to send the show and, and you're networking with these different people, how do you go about doing that? Um, all we had to begin with were, were the websites for the theatres and you'd have to call the theatre and try and get the name of the person who programmes the venue and then try and get them on the line, which is quite difficult because the person, the manager or the programmer of the theatre has so much work to do and so many things to fit into the calendar year. So you just have to start getting your name about and be very, very persistent. That's what we did. You have to phone them, you have to email them, you have to send them stuff through the mail we found still works, which we didn't think <laughs> would, but they like to get stuff in front of them and see. Oh, marketing materials is the other thing. You need to have a lot of materials to, that shows off your show. So we had a video done in the first year. Uh, someone came that we knew, luckily, to film the show in Wales. Uh, and then Chris, as I said earlier, who does a lot of the design stuff, designed some really good flyers. Uh, and CDs and stuff. So we send all of those out plus links to the website. Um, and you just sort of have to try and sell your show as well you can to, to the manager and say why it's different. In our case, there's a lot of shows that are similar to what we do. And you have to say, this is why it's different. And this is why people will come. And so selling points are obviously very key to that. Okay, and, and let's kind of jump in a little bit on that with the, the marketing side. And there's a lot of our students are actually studying how to market a, a theatre show at the moment. Um, cool. So who is your target audience for this show? And then, you know, how do you actually market to them? Well, we'd thought to begin with it and probably still do a bit. Obviously, it's going to be mostly the people that are around in that era or were uh, just after that era in the 60s or 70s who grew up with that music. So anyone who's from about late 50s to like 80 years old. We've found as we've gone on and we do different gigs outside of the theatre world that we've got a different audience sometimes of actually a lot younger people who are still into it. Mm. So it's it's quite it's been good, but it's also been quite tricky because those two age groups in terms of like, I don't know, 40 to 60 and then 60 upwards, they both have different channels of how they would find out about a show. So we've had to change our uh, marketing a bit as we've gone forward in terms of to begin with. It was mostly all on Facebook, all on social media. We're quite lucky that we've got about 13,000 followers on Facebook, which is good, but obviously not all of them will go to theatres. Um, so we've had to adapt uh, as we go along. So some of that's either newspaper advertising. Uh, you can get people just to go out and fly a town. You can pay someone who will go out and just deliver your flyers to uh, houses or put them in newspapers, that sort of thing. Um, we do a lot of radio. We're fortunate that we can go into London, into the BBC Broadcasting House and do a, a remote podcast like we're doing now. Um, a remote interview and we can speak to like local radio stations we did one a few weeks ago for bbc essex i think and and stuff like that so ag again we're still learning what the best ways are 
but I think you sort of have to put your hand in everything if you can afford to do it. No, absolutely. I totally agree with that. So what have you found then? If you could narrow it down to just one, um, what's been the most responsive way of marketing your show so far? Well, if you go to, so the theatres will help you out as well. So if you're booked with, let's say, if you're booked with the theatre in Richmond, they'll, you can do a lot of the advertising yourself. And then the theatre will say, how much money have you got to spend on marketing? And we'll tell them and they'll say, OK, well, we can do this for you as well. So the theatres will do a thing called an e-shot, which is they'll have a database of everyone that's either been to the theatre or books tickets or goes to theatres or goes to shows similar to ours. And we will we will come up with a, a promotional email and then they will send it specifically to those people. And in some cases, they've got a database of like 30,000 people or 5,000 people, depending on the size of the theater. And I found that helps the most. You just need to get it in front of people's faces. Okay. Um, we do a lot of work on Facebook adverts as well, where you can pay to sort of target that in certain areas of the country, mm. which do work. But I think the e-shot and the mail out, which is the mail equivalent of it, just getting the letter through the door, uh, I think that helps. So not you know necessarily social media efforts that actually get the most responses still. That's quite interesting. It varies. I think it, it still definitely varies depending on theatre. But I think it's it's a lot more um, of the older techniques, as you'd say, than than, than Facebook. No, that is very interesting, actually. So then what piece of advice would you give to um, a student who is looking to try and put on their own show and to market that then? The USP, the unique selling point, is the biggest thing we've always been told. We met with a couple of producers early on just to get advice and to see what they thought. And we had a lot of the show is called Rock and Roll Revolution. It was originally called Rock and Roll Music. And we were told that was a bit too. Uh, it, it didn't really it didn't really cover really what the show was. So we changed it to rock and roll revolution, which says, you know, we do the music uh, of the rock and roll of the fifties, but also the revolution part is we try and say what happened uh, in socially throughout the fifties, as well as just musically and about how all that changed. Um, so you have to get something that says what your show is. And we were also told that if you do a poster for your show, which is obviously one of the biggest, most important things to do, you have to imagine that um, someone is, spending two seconds looking at it because if you drive past the poster that's all all you're going to allow for attention is two seconds and does your poster convey everything you want to convey in just two seconds of looking at it which i think is a really good piece of advice um so i'd go yeah marketing in terms of image and what the name of your show is and why it stands out from all the other shows excellent and um, do you fancy sharing with us maybe your what you feel might have been your biggest mistake in marketing or, or the biggest waste of time or you know what's kind of the thing that hasn't worked for you um there have been some times where we've spent a lot of money on sometimes you don't know how many people will come and see the show based on if you've spent money on a guy to go and deliver flyers everywhere mm -hmm. you also in some cases would need to keep track of that and you'd like one of us would have to go to the town to just check that everything is being put up and and is being um delivered a lot of the theaters will ask you to send about five thousand flyers and wow you have to put faith in them that they are all going to people because we have got to theatre sometimes and they'll give us about 100 posters back and say, oh, we didn't use them. But you don't get the money back for that because you've spent the money on that. Um, so a few of those things we've sort of learned about not have to, you know, we don't send as much print to venues now as we used to because it's not all going to be used. Um, and as I say, it's it's just that, you know, there's sometimes we've used it, we've paid for a newspaper advert and it's not it's not come off. And then sometimes we've not Chichester, for example, we didn't spend much money on marketing at all, but they had a very good e-shot thing. They have a thing called Friends of the Theatre who are they're in touch with them all the time. These people that always come to the theatre. And I think they got told about our show first before it was on sale to the general public and it sold out very quickly. Oh wow! So it really varies with each theatre and also which part of the country you go to. Can we talk a bit about the casting process? So when you're obviously you guys have to cast the show as well, you're also in it yourselves. Um, what do you look for in a performer that you're casting in your show? So in our show, we've now got eight people on stage, which is uh, to go through quickly. Piano player, drums, bass, two guitars, female vocalist and then two female brass players. So first off, because all we're doing is music, they obviously have to be very proficient at the instrument or vocally. And mm -hmm. because it's theatre, they also have to be able to perform. And that's even if you're up the back 
uh, in my case, on drums, or if you're playing saxes or on the piano, you can't just play the instrument for two hours. People are looking at everybody on stage, as you know, as you well know. So for some people, that's a bit foreign. If we've just had to hire had to hire musicians before, there have been some people that have been amazing at what they do, but we've just not been able to hire them because there's just you can't get a smile out of them for two hours, and that's really <laughs> what you need to do. So that's just as important as how good they are. It's it's sort of your you're looking for another form of triple threat really which is uh performance ability on the instrument uh and also just how they are as a person because we travel together quite a lot that's quite important too yeah i was going to come to that so um yeah aside from being on stage what are the other relevant factors that contribute to your decision in in hiring someone so the things the practicalities of it i guess is what i'm asking well there are some things just as you know we very rarely but we sometimes will all travel together in a van if we're going away for four days in a row somewhere very far away but that doesn't always happen so we'll be asking people to car share so we have to consider the fact that we'll need enough drivers within the people that we hire so that they can get themselves to gigs otherwise you're having to pay for train fares and hotels for someone to stay over so they can get the train the next day Mm. um yeah things like that and just being personable just not having an attitude not you know the show is a group effort. It's fronted by Ollie, who's uh, the lead guitarist, and he does a lot of the chat, but it's still a group effort. It's a very big ensemble thing, so no one can think that they're bigger than the show or that the show's about them. And we've not, to be fair, we've not found that with anybody that we've used. They've always been a good team player and they've always mucked in. So what platforms do you use to advertise um, for your castings then? It's a bit different for us because, as I say, it is, it is foremost we need musicians so there are a few of the websites like mandy.com star now we've got a lot of success from using facebook um, there's a thing called debt musicians on there which has got a lot of followers on there and if you put an advert on there'll be responses very quickly we just had to get a keyboard player recently um who's actually from america but he's studying in liverpool called jack and he came through facebook and he just sent us some stuff and we auditioned him and then within a week he was doing shows for us so it uh, it varies sometimes we'll put adverts through um some of the actor musician agencies so like access we've gone through rose bruford who obviously produced more actor musicians um if we're if we're struggling to find someone who really we need them to perform we'll go through the actor musician agencies but it really varies and is that very different to the sort of auditions that you had to do when you were just an actor musician yourself? Well, mostly there's no text. So there's no script if they come in. We might say to them, would you be comfortable with speaking a little bit on stage? And you can sort of tell just from speaking to them whether they'd be good at that or whether they wouldn't. You can usually tell with them within the first 10 minutes about whether they're going to be really smiley on stage or whether they're just looking at their instrument the whole time. So um, so it, it's that. But usually when we audition people, we try and keep it quite relaxed because we've all been through auditions before. We know that it can sometimes be quite daunting. Mm. We'll try and keep the audition quite relaxed and we'll, we'll, we'll play with them as well. We won't just sit behind the table and watch. We'll, we'll play the instruments with them. So they've got more of a sort of band setting to be in, which I think helps. That's great. And so what would your advice be to a performer coming uh, to audition for a show like yours for the first time? just learning the material we play a specific era of music which is there's a bit of uh, i think a lot of people think it's just three chords but there's a bit of an art to it and we i'm always personally and i think the other two are as well a a fan of people who do the homework even when they've got the job we want people to come prepared if you you sort of come and you're sort of just guessing the parts a little bit then it's not really going to go very well but again just be friendly try and try and smile as much as you can in the audition because that really does get you a lot of points um and and you know then you'll walk then we'll warm to you straight away because you've got quite a you know smiley personality so i think that helps but it's a mix of things i would say obviously at the moment we're in the middle of quite a a different uh time of life it's a a pandemic like we've never known before so many performers and students now are worried about the state of theater for when this pandemic actually comes to a close um with all actors producers writers um currently out of work what is your company doing to maintain itself at this time? So we've had to, I mean, we had a lot of shows scheduled for now until June. Uh, yeah, until June. Uh, we've had to reschedule them, but obviously make sure they still happen, not just cancel them. There'll be a lot of people that have bought tickets and still want to go. So that's been the first thing we've had to do and be seen to making sure we tell the public that the shows are still going to happen. They're just going to be later down the line. So that's been the first part of the job. The second part is we've always been quite good about putting stuff online So either that means videos of sound checks or sometimes we'll go into a studio and do a video or just do bits of audio. And so we've done that a bit differently in that we've been doing isolation recording. So we'll all record a part of a song. So I'll record the drums in my house. Uh, A guitarist will record it in his and Chris will edit them all together. And we've made a few videos on our page. And that's 
been keeping people entertained one so you're securing your own base to your own fan base to still be loyal to you but we've also actually found we've had a lot of new people come we've invited a lot more people to the facebook page because the last video got like 500 likes or something so that's now starting to boost an audience so our plan is to do that for the next few months so that we've retained our fan base but we're also now growing another one so therefore might you know it might boost ticket sales even more when we eventually come out of this and i think just still being just reminding people that you're still around you can't just go into lockdown online either you still Mm -hmm. have to be seen to be busy and say you know we're going to be back and this is what we're doing until then yeah, absolutely. You have to still be doing things in this time off. Yeah. Um, so what would you say to reassure performers in training at the moment who are concerned that there might not be much of an industry to move into? I think there will be. And I mean, it's difficult to predict it, isn't it? It's, it's going to be tough. And for regional theatres, I think it's going to be a lot tougher because they've got uh, much bigger outgoings and they, you know, their, their income varies all the time. But in terms of all the big theatres, everything that goes into the West End, I really can't see... I can't see it all closing down permanently. People will still want to go to the theatre and be entertained. And it's such a big industry um, that I would be really shocked if it if it all closed down. It will be different. I think it will be different when it comes out of this. There might be uh, much more people looking for one job. So there may be you find that maybe more there are more people auditioning for one job than there used to be. But I sort of think after a while that will level off. Um, and it's just getting through in the same in, in, in every other industry in the world. Once you come out of this, it will be different for a few months. But I would be very surprised if everything just shut down and, and was killed off. And so then you, know, you mentioned that it'll probably end up with a lot more people going for the same job. What do you think young performers who are still training can do um, to try and keep their hand and keep their skills going? What can they be doing whilst they're not at college or in their training facility? Just keep learning. I mean, there's so many videos online. I mean, there's a lot of good and bad videos, but if you find the good videos online, even if it's just watching. I mean, I've noticed now that some of the big theatres have started putting entire shows online. So I think you could watch Wicked the other week. uh, And there are a few other theatres that are showing their shows. The National Theatre are now broadcasting stuff every week. So even just from learning, sorry, just from watching shows, you can learn so much stuff. Um, And yeah, just sort of keep practising your art as much as you can, which I know is difficult when you're not, you know, in a group setting. Um, but I think just keep on learning and be ready. Just be, go with the mindset that this could all end tomorrow, it, you know. Um, and would you be ready tomorrow to jump in and do an audition and do the best th- best thing that you can do? So just, you know, as much as you can dedicate all this free time we have to just learning more things. Excellent. Um, so then practicing what you preach, then, I guess, what, what are you doing to, to maintain your skill set? Personally, obviously, playing the drums uh, is quite difficult to not annoy everyone in the... Uh, <laughs> the vicinity um i've bought things like practice drum kits that are quiet um just to be able to practice at home a bit and keep up my uh ability on the drums i've also been churning out videos on a daily basis just uh, to begin with it was just for fun but people seem to be quite liking them just been playing short excerpts of songs that i think don't get much recognition on the drums and uh I've been doing that as well as doing the Blue Jays videos. We've also been doing Blue Jays podcast as well, which has been quite good just to sort of tell people what we're up to and they get a bit of an insight into what we do and how we do it. So, yeah, same as anyone. I'm just trying to keep busy and and have a bit of a schedule to my day. Thank you very much for speaking with us, Dan. That's been really insightful. I'm sure our students will agree. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me. No problem. (laughs) 